swing and a hit finally for Nikki Haley, 2024 Republican president, ca presidential candidate. Haley took the cake in last night's Washington, D.C. GOP primary. Haley won 62.8 percent of the votes from the nation's capital, marking her first primary win of the year, while former President Donald Trump took 33.3 percent. Here's Haley on Donald Trump. This is a ship that has a hole in it. Donald Trump is the hole. If if we decide to go down with Donald Trump as the nominee, we can assume that the ship is going to sink. I'm saying we need to go in a new direction. We can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. And I have said from the beginning, the party that gets rid of their 80-year-old candidate is the party that's going to win. But the former South Carolina governor is still lagging far behind Trump nationally. So far, Trump has won 244 delegates, while Haley is behind with 43. 1,215 delegates are needed to win the Republican nomination, according to the Associated Press. This is the last primary ahead of Super Tuesday, where tomorrow voters in 16 states and one territory will cast their votes for who they want to see in the Oval Office in the largest GOP primary election of 2024. Joining us now to weigh in is The Hill's national political reporter, Julia Manchester. Welcome, Julia. Thanks for having me, guys. So some interesting developments. Uh, a win for Haley in D.C. I guess all, uh, you know, 12 Republicans right, or whatever who right. live here uh, prefer her. That's not that surprising. But, um, you know, she's making her pitch, obviously, based on the age and the unpopularity of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, but this is a message that seems not to be resonating enough so far with the Republican base. Yeah, you're absolutely right. D.C. Republican primary win for Haley, not surprising and really not that consequential in the long term when it comes to delegates. What Haley really needs to do on Super Tuesday is somehow get a win in, you know, one of these states at least or maybe, uh, you know, at least get close to that. Now, some of the states we're watching are Virginia and North Carolina, particularly Northern Virginia and the Charlotte area of North Carolina, Mecklenburg County, those areas. You know, those are the suburban, you know, uh, enclaves that Nikki Haley tends to do better than Donald Trump in. That being said, though, Donald Trump is very much expected to run up the score in rural parts of, the, of Virginia, rural parts of North Carolina. So hard to say what it's going to look like for her tomorrow in terms of whether she's going to perform well in these states. But we are seeing that Donald Trump very much still on track to look, winning. It's a mixed bag for Haley. This, look, it's a win. I'm sure she's happy to right. not have to kind of lose another loss. On that side of the register, she got an endorsement from Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. I don't know if you think that that will have any kind of influence in the outcome here. But she's also lost her funding from the uh, Koch Brothers PAC that was providing her with much-needed cash, cash influx, uh, influx. How long do you anticipate her being in this race? I think it depends on what happens tomorrow night. Uh, you bring up a great point about the Koch Brothers and you know that funding. Um, that's a big loss. However, her campaign maintains that they're still fundraising raising. They're still bringing in that money. So theoretically, she could stay in uh, as long as she's continuing to get and keep get, bringing in that money. The question is, though, what's the point of that? Does she want to have a floor fight? And it's hard to see how there would be a floor fight because she hasn't really gotten a substantial number of get delegates so far. Is she thinking about something maybe outside of the Republican Party? She says no unequivocally. However, I think a lot of us are scratching our heads thinking, you know, it, the writing seems to be on the, the wall. What's your end game here? Well, and she just lost one of her arguments, which is that maybe, not that she agrees with it, but maybe Trump can't appear on the ballot. That argument goes out the right. window this morning with the Supreme Court ruling 9-0 that no, Donald Trump's name can appear on the ballot. So she can't even make that, no. look, if you want a candidate at all, <laughs> I'm still in this race. That argument's going away. Um, you mentioned the possible third party uh, potential for Nikki Haley. I am seeing some speculation, the whole no labels thing. However, she says she don't want to, doesn't want to share a ticket with a Democrat. So that actually does seem pretty unlikely to me. Right. But what do you think uh, she's thinking through these things? Yeah, she says she doesn't want to share a ticket with the Democrats on no labels. And no label says they haven't been in contact with her, even though when asked about it, no labels has not been. To, they're saying, oh, we're open to anyone. And anyone includes Nikki Haley. But I guess the question is, you know, if it's not no labels, is 
Is it another independent party bid? But then there's the logistical question of, OK, how are you able to get on the ballot in these states? You're still seeing RFK Jr., someone who I would say does have um, you know, some traction. He's still trying to get on the ballot in some of these states. So this late in the game for Nikki Haley is going to be tough. And even though we talk about how it's questionable as to whether she has a place in Trump's Republican Party, if she were to go against that primary pledge she signed, the, the RNC pledge, I should say, she signed and she you know, broke that pledge, I think she'd create a lot more enemies in the Republican Party, and that would really throw her future up But in that's the, the question, yeah. right? Is it possible for her to really meaningfully dig herself right. into a deeper hole, given that it is what it is? The MAGA faction of the Republican Party is powerful and ascendant. She has taken a stand in a different kind of a lane, right? She's out here appealing to more college-educated voters, uh, the, the D.C. kind of more political voters. People in Northern Virginia seem to be a good yeah. bet for her. And if she's willing to just occupy that space and have a pretty decent electability argument going for her as well for people who just don't want the Democrat to win, don't want Joe Biden to win. You heard her making the age pitch, saying the first party that gets rid of their octogenarian is going to win. You see her in these matchups showing better odds against Joe Biden than Donald Trump does. So is there really a lot to, for her to lose there and continuing to double down on this argument and say, look, I'm going to stay in it as long as I can be in it. Perhaps there's even a lane for me to run as an independent with a bigger war chest than uh, RFK Jr., more of ability to buy my way onto the ballot in more of these states. We don't know what's going to happen with Donald Trump in some of these other cases and whether or not the public will eventually turn from him because he might be found guilty of some of this election interference stuff. You know, is there a case for her to keep doing what she's doing and staying in until some of these other factors might start to shift. It is the case 2028. Right, That's right. the reason to stay in. You know, I was talking with a number of her supporters at a campaign event in Northern Virginia last week, and I said, look, you're out here, you know, campaigning for her, you're supporting her. Do you think she will actually win Virginia? Do you think she will win a state on Super Tuesday? And the majority of supporters I chatted with said, no, but we need someone to occupy this lane because this is someone who represents us. And they did bring up the possibility of what happened, you know, if something were to happen to Donald Trump legally, for example, that, you know, she could be somewhere, someone waiting in the wings. In terms of 2028, that's a great point. And we talk about that RNC pledge. If she were to go against that pledge, I think there is the argument that she would be throwing away 2028 on the Republican ticket altogether. So I don't know. We can pontificate all day about what Nikki Haley is going to do. At the end of the day, she only knows her end game. But I think we might have tomorrow some clearer idea of what her future yeah, I, looks like. I think you're very right about that. I, I mean, she's, you know, she's being very um, critical of Donald Trump, the person, um, while also still having some policy differences, right. but is very much still positioning herself as within the Republican Party and has proven to have a kind of more formidable base of support to some degree, not enough, but she's done okay numbers in various places. I think she'll have a pitch to make if she wants to in 2028 if she does not totally alienate herself from the party, leaving the party, actually running third party or with no labels or that kind of thing. That would, I think, sever her 2028 possibilities within the GOP, which is not something I think she wants because she's, she's going to have a chance if she wants to do it in 2028. Yeah, absolutely. And we talk about how this is Trump's party, and I think it's absolutely Trump's party at this point. But there still are Republicans who fall into Haley's lane, those more, I guess, pre-Trump establishment Republicans, those country club Republicans, more maybe in some cases more moderates. They're not the majority, but they're still there. So, you know, in terms of what that looks like in 2028, we'll see. However, even without Trump at the top of the ballot in 2028, I still think it's the Amer it's going to be the America First Party. Yeah. So I'm curious to see how she navigates that. There's no disagreement on that. And it is Trump's party. But once, I mean, if he were to win this time and would be right. literally unable to run again, then you you might see his influence right. not, not, go, not evaporate, but diminish right. somewhat. Of course, if he loses this time, <laughs> still run in 2028 is the, is yeah. the other thing. I, mean, I, don't know I, I, I don't know that he's necessarily done. I guess but. I'm not as confident that absent Trump as a figurehead, the Republican Party remains Trump's party. Okay. You know, I, I think that would be really, uh, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. It does seem like a lot of the folks who have fallen in line, we were just talking about this in an earlier segment, the um, Ron DeSantis, Mar Mark Rubio's of the world have had an evolution, as it were, where they seem to have come around to being MAGA because that's where 
the energy is. Yeah. And I don't know that we have seen anyone ascendant who has demonstrated an ability to exert the same kind of influence that Trump has that has made the Republican Party fall in line, despite the fact that I don't think the majority of elected Republicans, frankly, are MAGA. We see the Freedom Caucus, that's a subset of Republicans, not the Republican Party as a whole. I think the base, the voters are different, but the party itself, I think, would perhaps relish a return Trump, to the mean. Trump's ability to maintain control of the party, even after the 2020 loss, was pretty unprecedented mm -hmm. and a pretty powerful demonstration of, of, of his hold. So that's why I, I think, it, it, that was a logical exit point for this being Trump's party, and he maintained total control but of it, which makes me think— could someone else do that that's not named Donald Trump? Yeah, well, that is the question. Yeah, yeah. all right. Well, Julia, thank you so much for Thanks, joining guys. us. We'll have more Rising right after this. Please stay tuned.